A regular guy in a three-piece suit sat on the edge of the party and quietly scrolled through his computer. Two couples, Gary Harris and Belinda Cummings and Jason Witten and Melissa Foster, went to the event, which was a wedding practice dinner dance. Gary, who is tall and has wavy blonde hair and blue eyes, talked to other people. Belinda, who is shorter and has curly brown hair and a striking figure, stood out with Melissa, whose long blonde hair made her look even better. Jason and Gary have known each other since grade school, while Belinda and Melissa became close in college. Gary went around introducing himself to people he didn't know until he saw a man working alone with a clipboard. He smiled and reached out to shake his hand. Hey, my name is Gary Harris and I'm one of the groomsmen, Gary said, shaking the man's hand. I'm Preston Fulton, but everyone calls me Press, the man said, with a bigger smile, Gary asked, which bride or other groom are you here for? Actually, I'm here for you and Jason, Press replied. But first, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you and Jason together. Gary didn't feel comfortable with the request. You have an edge over me, he said. Asking, what do you need to talk to me about? What do you need to talk to Jason and me about? Press took an envelope out of his pocket. I think this letter will make most of my plans clear. I will talk to Jason alone if you don't want to hear anything else after reading it, Gary said. He opened the envelope and started to read. He was shocked when he saw that it was from his dad, but what it said really shocked him. This message is very painful for me to send through Mr. Fulton, Belinda cheated on you, and Mr. Fulton has proof. Please follow Mr. Fulton's advice after you look at the evidence. The company he works for does a lot more than just find proof that your future wife is cheating on you, so I hired them. Listen carefully to Mr. Fulton and believe what he says. My mom and I love you, and I'm so sorry you were hurt in such a mean way. I will always be here for you if you need to talk after the sad business is over. Love, Dad. Gary read the letter over and over again, shocked by what it said. He had a deep love for Belinda and thought she was the right match for him. He loved everything about her, she was beautiful, smart, funny, and caring. How was she going to hurt him? Even though Gary didn't trust his father and thought the letter might be fake, he still couldn't get over the charge against his future wife. Gary got even more angry and said, I don't believe my father. If it were true, he would have told me himself, Gary said. Let me introduce myself, Press said, handing Gary a business card that said, Me Incorporated with Preston Fulton, field representative at the bottom. What is Me Incorporated? He inquired. Press said, it stands for male equality. What's this about? Gary was now very angry. Press said in a quiet voice, our group's goal is to restore gender equality, which is what groups like now are trying to do. They've changed views, which could affect your fiancé's actions. That's ridiculous, Gary said. What does that have to do with Belinda cheating on me? In a direct sense, nothing. But it talks about how her behavior is affected by the society she lives in, Press responded. Press paused to make sure Gary wasn't just thinking about Belinda. For example, a lot of elementary school teachers, mostly women, consistently give boys lower grades, which reinforces negative ideas about what it means to be a guy. This impacts generations, leading to dependence and underrepresentation in higher education and academia. Me Incorporated aims to break this loop. Gary could feel his cool slipping. Just now, he was feeling great. Now he was getting angry because he needed to be sure that Belinda was cheating on him. Fine, but where's the proof? Press gently put his hand on Gary's arm to reassure him. Do what your father told you to do before I show you the proof. Pay close attention to what I say and do what I say. When you see the tapes, you'll probably want to talk to your fiancé right away. But acting on impulse will hurt your chances of getting real revenge. It's not just about getting back at them. It's also about sending a strong message. Gary's heart was racing, and his hands were sweating. After a moment, he nodded. Shall confront her tonight or not, I still need to talk to you and Jason. Gary said with another nod, it won't change the present, but it will protect your future. As Mr. Fulton pressed the launch button on the screen and gave Gary the tablet, he gave a happy nod. Gary quickly saw Belinda getting close to guys she didn't know. Gary's worries were eased at first when he saw a video of Belinda with an ex-boyfriend just days after they agreed to be alone on New Year's Eve, which went against what they had agreed to. Later films showing their six-month engagement showed that Belinda was seeing other men, some of whom were Gary's friends. At the rehearsal party, Gary almost lost it when he saw the last film. Spencer Tolliver, who was Belinda and Gary's best man, was shown having sexual relations in Gary's room. Gary's anger was increased by the conversation that followed, in which Belinda said she wanted to keep seeing him after they got married. 
The betrayal hurt him so much that he fought the urge to act without thinking. Press saw that Gary was upset and took a bottle out of his pocket to offer to Gary to help him feel better. Do you feel any better? Mr. Fulton asked. Your reaction is normal when you're caught off guard. I'll explain soon how we'll handle this, Press told Gary. But take comfort in knowing about Belinda's betrayal now rather than years from now, when children may be involved. Once Gary calmed down, Press told him to get Jason. Gary had to tell his friend that Belinda had been cheating on him before tomorrow's wedding. Press's advice was very important for both of their prospects, even though Jason wasn't in the same situation. Gary finally got Jason away from the groom after a short time. As they were leaving, Gary whispered in Jason's ear that it had to be done right away. Jason was initially suspicious and didn't say anything until Gary gave him more information about Belinda's lie. Jason, like Gary, didn't believe the news at first. Instead of showing Jason the film, Mr. Fulton showed him three photos that showed Belinda cheating on Jason. Once they were seated, Press wrote down what they were saying on a clipboard and went into more detail about the work of his group. He planned to look over his presentation to make it better and send a copy to headquarters to be looked over. This is Emmy Incorporated always wanted to grow, protect its members, and get information to them quickly and easily. Press said he felt bad about what Belinda did and gave Gary a packet with information about what he needed to do for the ceremony. After this, he gave each young man a book about Emmy Incorporated's goals, problems, and advice for married life. The book supported Press's suggestion and pointed out that their dads had gotten them lifetime memberships. After making sure Gary stayed calm, Press nodded his agreement as Gary told Belinda he was going to his parents' house because he had stomach problems, which was a planned reason to follow a wedding practice. Gary bade Belinda goodbye with a simple kiss on the cheek, and she kept enjoying the party, though she was a little confused about how she was acting, which was okay because the wedding was coming up soon. Press got ready to leave by taking his coat out of the checkout area. He looked forward to going home to his family because he had a lot of things to do, like being in charge of Gary's wedding tomorrow. Press put on his scarf and winter coat and stepped out into the cold Ohio night. The cloudy sky was filled with snowflakes that made it look like a storm was coming. He really wanted to be in beautiful South Florida. Press found the main campus of the huge Cleveland Clinic very quickly while driving on Interstate 20 toward East Cleveland. Even though parking can be hard, the almost empty lot made it easy to find a place quickly. After getting around the building and checking in, Press looked for something else to do. A lot of the preparation work was done, but there were still some jobs to do on site. When Press saw Ben Sharpen in the restaurant, he went up to him. Ben was 49 years old, but he looked much older than that. His worn-out appearance suggested that he had no joy in his life. Press introduced himself, My name is Preston Fulton. Contact me by name Press. My job at Me Incorporated is to help people like you. The man got up and gave him a handshake. Hello, I don't find anything surprising about my ex-wife Connie. Furthermore, he stated, I honestly don't think you can help. I really don't care about what Connie does or what my kids do. I think I have something that might be interesting to you. Let me start by asking about your marriage and breakup. Press one asked. Ben said with a shrug, not much to tell. It quickly got worse after we got married young. It was hard for Connie to do her jobs, especially after she got pregnant. I often thought about getting a divorce, but in the end I chose to stay together for the kids. I finally found out she was cheating on me and filed for divorce, but the court gave me a bad time. While drinking his coffee, Ben shook his head. Sighing, he said, 12 years of marriage wasted. She was caught with a UPS driver in our bed. That lawyer you hired was not very good. The press asked, tell me about the final divorce decree. After I became head of the x-ray department and started making good money, the judge gave me almost nothing of what I had made before. Thanks to alimony and child support, I have to pay the bills while Connie has fun with her new boyfriend. Ben angrily explained, lawyers say I can't do anything. Press thought, this is one of the worst injustices I've seen. We have to do something. Ben responded with anger, thank you, but I only have two more alimony payments to make, and I'm done with those kids. From the start, Connie has turned them against me. Though I can't do anything right now, I'm glad you're on my side. Press opened his suitcase and told her, there's more you need to know that could make a big difference. Not sure what that is. Ben asked, amused. First, Mr. Sharpen, none of these three kids are yours, Press said, setting down DNA tests. That shady woman. People in the cafeteria looked at Ben as he slammed his hand on the table in surprise. Although, the noise started up again after a moment. 
Press saw that Ben's mood changed and that his voice lowered. I'm not really relieved because I'm almost done with divorce. That way I won't feel bad about how much I hate those kids. With a smile, Press told them, no, your relief is just beginning. Please allow me to explain. We know who the real dads are of all three kids. They're wealthy married men, and we're suing them to get back the tens of thousands of dollars in child support you paid. Their cheating wives will find out, which could lead to divorce. Ben sat there stunned. Does this exist? Indeed, and more is on the way. Press promised that we'd fix any wrongs. Why do you want to help? Ben asked, showing worry. I have no money for it. I'm not charging you, Ben. Press made it clear that their company supports equal rights for men and women. I didn't know there was such a group, Ben said. How do you pay for your business, though? Press stated that they use the interest from their capital fund. We keep getting new members who pay one time and yearly dues. There is also membership for life. All of the money we get goes into our capital fund, which is getting close to $2 billion right now. In addition, donors give us money for legislation and our endowment. Ben said, I haven't paid anything and I can't afford to. Ben, calming down. You are not paying for this case. We, me incorporated. Press promised him that it would cover all costs. Ben said, I don't know how to thank you. Thank us later. Let me explain more, Press went on. The judge has been lied to by your ex-wife. Drug sales gave her illegal cash even while you were married. The money she had was tracked down and taken away. She will find out tomorrow that her money is gone, but that's not the end of it. The police are going to search your old house because she was caught with so many drugs that she is now thought to be a big supplier. We also think she may have been involved in the death of a teenager from her medicines, which would probably get her 15 years in prison. Her children and ex-lovers will also be charged, which will make sure she spends years in prison. As Ben thought about what he had read, his eyes got bigger. Press kept going, now here's the most important part. The brokerage house and law company that hired the people who were involved in your wife's pregnancy are being sued for taking advantage of both of you. We expect that each of you will get a large seven-figure payout. You can use this money to buy a lifetime membership in me incorporated if you want to, but it's not necessary for your free case. A smile appeared on Ben's face. It makes me feel better just to think about all of this, and if the money does come through as you say, I'll definitely buy a lifetime membership. Ben signed a few forms and then went back to his room to get some rest before the wedding. There was no more snow the next day, and it was a beautiful, sunny day. Press thought the bride would be happy with the weather. The temperature stayed around 20 degrees, but the lack of wind made it bearable. With the wedding set for 1.30 p.m., Press read the paper slowly for an hour, practicing a skill he learned in school, noticing bias in the news. By 12.45 p.m., he was ready for the service and sitting in the back row of the church on the groom's side. Press looked around the room for the cameraman after he was seated. When he didn't see them, he got up to look. If the assigned videographer wasn't there, Press would use his handheld camera, even though he didn't like doing that because the quality would be worse. In the end, he found the videographer on the rooftop, which was a great place to shoot. When Press was done, he went back to his place. Just at 1.30, the organist stopped playing random songs and started playing the wedding march. It was already set up with Gary, the best man, and the groom's friends on one side of the stage. The bride slowly walked down the aisle, with her father by her side. Ten minutes before the service, the two white screens were moved so that they faced the people in the room. The priest started the ceremony by asking Gary Lewis Harris if he would take Belinda Marie Cummings as his legal wife, to love and hold her through illness and health, wealth and poverty, and to leave all other women behind until death do them part. Gary didn't say anything for a few tense moments, his eyes fixed on Belinda. There were murmurs among the guests because he took so long to answer. Then, Gary turned to the crowd and said, Belinda, I don't want you to be my wife. With the push of a button, videos of Belinda cheating on her husband filled the screens, causing chaos. Some people hurriedly left the church while Belinda and her mother screamed. Press saw that Spencer's face was pale as Gary moved toward him. Gary, it's me, your best man, Spencer whispered, but Gary punched him in the nose, cutting him off. As Spencer stumbled backwards with blood running down his face, the sound of a bone breaking could be heard throughout the church. This also happened to the priest and some of Belinda's dress. Belinda broke down crying so hard that her mother had to try to comfort her. In the meantime, Belinda's angry father immediately cut ties with her. Gary's friends, except for Jason, were confused and didn't know what to do. 
Jason took a step forward and put up his hand. He said in a scary voice, that thing on the ground is trash. Staying true to it makes you not our friend. As the guys looked at Jason and the damning video, they all nodded their heads. Someone said, I don't want anything to do with that idiot. Then Jason helped Spencer get back up after he had fallen. Hey Spencer, pay attention. Jason's voice boomed with disdain. It's official, you're a jerk. I've known Gary for a long time, and this is how you thank him? In addition to being his best man, you're also an ADA. When your boss sees this on Monday, how do you think he'll act? How about the Bar Association? As a courtesy to everyone, please leave this place right away. Plus don't try to keep track of our numbers. Spencer slid past Jason and out of the church through a back door. In the meantime, Gary got the package that Mr. Fulton had given him the night before and hid it behind a column close to the altar. From it, he made pictures of Belinda with other guys and gave them to people. They were met first by the bridesmaids, then by Belinda and her mother. Gary told Belinda, here are some souvenirs for you. He then dropped a stack of them on her lap. Her eyes were filled with pain as she looked up at him. Dear Gary, I am truly sorry. I care about you. The sarcastic Gary shook his head. What am I missing? You love Spencer by having fun with him. You really are a sex offender, Belinda. I'm glad that's not my problem, but you need help. Good luck with your awful life. She begged Gary to give her another chance. While he was walking away, Gary shot back over his shoulder. Not a possibility. He walked down the aisle and threw pictures all over the seats. He was caught by his father, who put his hand on his shoulder. Gary, let's go ahead. There is still a welcome. I guess we should get something to eat. Gary looked over at his dad's sad smile. Parents, hold on. Someone else should see these pictures. Gary walked up to the strong, gray-haired man who was Belinda's boss at the well-known financial company where she had worked for two years. Hello, Mr. Turner. My name is Gary Harris, Gary said to him. We talked at the Christmas party for your business. Mr. Turner answered, Yes, Gary, I remember. He then got up and helped his wife stand up. I'm really sorry about what took place. Gary showed six more pictures. Take these shots, please. Gary, there's no need, Mr. Turner said. Enough is enough for me. As Gary gave them to Mrs. Turner, he made it clear that they weren't for him. Take them, Mrs. Turner. You and Belinda in pictures. She looked stupid because you had her lying all over your desk. If you love these pictures as much as your husband and Belinda love that moment, then so will I. Gary looked at his dad and said, I'm ready to go, dad. Press smiled while recording the conversation. After talking with the videographer to make sure of the facts, Press went back to his room. He had to write his report and watch the movie of his talk with Gary and Jason. Press read over his report twice to make sure he had included everything. Then he went over the talk with Gary and Jason again, making notes on his list for each point. He started by explaining that Mean's job is to make sure that men are treated equally by the law and to help people who are dealing with cheating. Women usually get main custody and alimony when their marriage ends, even if both parents are equally capable, the people who went learned this. Mink pushed for fair limits on divorce and stressed how important it was for women to return to work. Also, they suggested joint custody, in which parents switch homes every two weeks so that kids spend more time with both parents. The press emphasized the need for birth control and warned men not to believe women who say they use it, since unprotected sex could lead to unwanted pregnancies. Feminism spread the idea that women should be the only ones to decide if they were pregnant, which hurt men. Meink believed that women should be able to choose to have an abortion, but they didn't like it when women who chose to keep a child avoided paying for it. Women could choose to have an abortion even if a guy didn't agree with her. But if she decided to keep the child, the man couldn't legally stop her, but he usually had to pay child support, which Meink thought was unfair. Press was out in the field and rarely got calls, so the ringing phone surprised him. Usually, he checked in with his wife every night, so a call from her out of the blue meant that something was wrong. The office sometimes reached out, but this interruption made him nervous. Press picked up the phone while pausing his tablet. He told Turner, hey, something's come up. Baker was Press's boss. Unfortunately, you will have to stay one more day. What is happening? The representative who is supposed to be in Akron tomorrow for another job is sick. You only need to be there when it's filmed. Not only record sound, but also record everything. You will get the bonus for the extra day in your next paycheck. 
Press smiled and said, don't worry, my camera is charging, and I'm always up for extra cash. I'm committed to what we do, though. We value how hard you work. Sending you an email with the information. The weather has caused your flight to be rescheduled. Thank you for letting me take you away from your family. We'll try to get out before it storms. It's going to snow 15 to 20 inches. Press saw the email after the call. In this case, the wife of a famous screenwriter wanted to be a movie star. Even though he wanted to stay, he had other things to do. She had affairs with people in the business during their five-year marriage in order to advance her career. She booked parts in Kirk Southern's future movies because she is dating him. As part of his job, Press made sure that all the details were taken care of. The job was carefully planned and carried out. He then checked his email to see if the flight information had changed. Press found how guys felt about me incorporated when he looked at the video again. The talks were interesting, especially Gary and Jason's. However, DNA testing was the subject that got the most attention. We, me incorporated. Worked to make DNA tests for babies a requirement in all 50 states. This step was meant to prove fatherhood right away, which would help find any possible health problems. Men have trouble showing they are the fathers of children in a short amount of time, which leaves them financially responsible for children who aren't theirs. If the proposed rule passes, men would be able to stop paying for children who are not their own at any time. As Press watched the presentation on his tablet, he carefully wrote down every point that was brought up. He paused the movie at a certain point, one that he hadn't thought about in his last marriage, his wife's refusal to make love. Financial disagreements were still the main reason why couples fight, but problems with closeness had become more important. As time went on, laws were made that said men couldn't force their wives to be intimate, which Press supported. But he wondered what the point of marriage was if one partner could refuse to be close for no reason. Me Incorporated suggested prenuptial agreements as an option. No matter how much money a man had, they told him to sign one. In addition to dividing property, these agreements also talked about cheating. If one partner cheated, the other spouse would get 70% of the property. Also, they required a weekly intimacy plan to make sure that no partner had to deal with rejection. If these rules were broken, the couple would get a divorce, but the spouse who refused would only get 20% of the property. Press fully backed me incorporated, even though he had some doubts about the group's beliefs. He had personal experience with their free help when his cheating ex-wife made threats against him. Press agreed that his life with Ben would have been even harder without their help. The next day, Press got up early for a very important meeting over breakfast. He was told to meet Janet Arnold, which is unusual for a woman. We, me incorporated, was ready for this kind of thing. Press saw Janet sitting in a booth in the back with her two kids, who were drawing placemats to pass the time. The children, ages seven and five, seemed happy, but they did check on their mother every once in a while. Janet looked worn out because her blonde hair was messy and she didn't have any makeup on. Press felt better knowing he could help her out, even though she was pregnant. At first, Press was surprised by cases like this, which made him wonder why he was helping a woman. He thought that the job of me incorporated was to help guys. But Mr. Wagner, a senior vice president, made it clear that me incorporated wanted real female equality, not just one-sided support. Even though they mostly helped guys, they would also help women if a member was cheating on their spouse. Press got to like me incorporated more over time. Instead of wanting to go back to old gender roles, me incorporated wanted fair rules that didn't favor one gender over another. The group wanted to protect marriages wholly and stop cheating by giving cheaters harsh punishments. They thought that harsh punishments for cheating could keep people from having affairs. Press said to Mrs. Arnold, thank you for meeting me. He then sat down in the booth across from her. She looked uncomfortably at her kids and said, I hope you don't mind, Mr. Fulton. Unfortunately, my mom couldn't watch the kids. That wasn't a problem, he told the kids with a smile. Feeling hungry? This place has great pancakes that are smothered in whipped cream and sprinkles. When Press mentioned food, both of the kids got excited, which made him feel sad. Janet told him, you don't have to. You learned about my husband's bank account and how I can get to the money in it. It's been hard to get cash since Thad left. Simply tell me, and we'll go. Press told the server, don't you understand? I want to talk to you about a lot of things. While we wait for our food, I will tell you everything you need to know. Janet was hesitant at first, but her children's hopeful looks made her give in. For the kids, Press got pancakes with whipped cream and sprinkles, bacon, hash browns, and chocolate milk. 
Press picked a Western omelette, while Janet chose boiled eggs, toast, and coffee. Margaret introduced her seven-year-old son Michael and five-year-old daughter Terry after the drinks were given. Janet told them simply that her husband Simon had left with Tammy, who was his secretary, leaving behind debts and no money to pay the bills. Simon was no longer visible, and Janet had no idea where he was. While the kids were eating their breakfast, Press brought up the subject. You must have known about your husband's first marriage, right? Janet said yes. He said she was sneaky and set up proof against him. Press confirmed this by pulling a folder out of his bag. Mary, his first wife, not only drained his bank accounts, she also set him up for having pills. We stepped in to keep them from going to jail. Janet set down her fork and said, I'm confused. Who do you really work for? Also, how did you help Simon? As Press put it, think of us like an insurance company. Your husband pretty much bought an insurance to protect himself from being lied to. It turned out Mary wasn't as smart as she originally thought. Her prints were discovered on one of the pill bags, and her source said she was responsible, which led to her arrest. In addition, we found Simon's moved funds and got them back. Janet seemed to understand this and went back to eating. When I first called you, Press said, opening the folder. I had only recently started my research. Usually, I wouldn't have contacted you so quickly, but I knew you needed money right away. I found more of your husband's talents since we last talked. How did you know about this? Janet stopped talking. Thad was in charge of the money, and I was in charge of the kids and the house. So far, I found about $2 million in cash that he took, Press said. He also has silent partnership stakes in three businesses that bring in about $100,000 a year. There is a lot of proof that Mrs. Arnold should get half of these partnerships. Janet sat there completely speechless. Without saying a word, she leaned in, her eyes sad. That might be true, but I can't fight my husband right now. My budget doesn't even cover a divorce lawyer. Press comforted Mrs. Arnold, don't worry, by patting her hand. We've set you up with a great lawyer. He'll get in touch soon. By court order, your husband will pay the lawyer's fees. We've also found him with his girlfriend in Costa Rica. All of his assets have been frozen except for the money set aside for your living costs. Janet shook and her eyes filled with tears. There's no meanness in this joke, right? I promise you it's all true, Press said, giving her an envelope with proof. I will help you get into the first account privately before you leave. Bring me to that table that's not being used so we can talk without having to bother your kids. Press got a strange look from Janet before she told the kids to be good and move to a nearby table. The kids stayed focused on their food. After things calmed down, Press brought up the touchy subject. You likely already knew that your husband isn't very honest. He's gone too far, and our rules spell out what will happen if he does it again. First rule, don't cheat. There was confusion on Janet's face. The results? Whatever kind? So, after you get your share, most of his money that's left over will be used to pay fines to me incorporated. His way of life will get much worse after jail, but he won't go bankrupt. Lock up? Janet yelled more loudly than she meant to. For what reason? Not paying taxes and not having enough money. Possibly at least six months. To answer your question, Tammy, his secretary, is stuck in Costa Rica with nothing. Due to Thad hiding her papers, it won't be easy for her to go back. Janet laughed out loud, and her face lit up with a smile. After signing a bunch of formal papers, Press got up. I need to go now. On the other hand, he took an envelope out of his pocket before putting on his winter coat. Put this $500 here. Invest in some winter gear for you and your kids, and then have fun. Janet kissed him on the face after saying goodbye to the kids. Janet replied, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm really grateful. Press paid the bill before leaving for Akron, where he had another job waiting for him. He met in a meeting room at the offices of Moreland, Connor, and Stiles the next day. In her divorce case, Beverly Bracken was helped by these lawyers. Gloria Connor was in charge of the court case and the talks. This company rarely lost because they were known for being aggressive in divorce cases. But today was different, it was their worst loss yet. Paul Bracken's lawyer was Elliot Chalmers, a middle-aged man who didn't stand out and looked more like a British government worker than a lawyer. Elliot, Press, and Paul all sat down at the same table, with Paul in the middle of the three of them. Gloria Connor, Mrs. Bracken, for paralegals, a court stenographer, and a secretary who was finishing up notarizations were sitting on the other side. Press saw Paul and Beverly both. 
Paul, with his dark hair and friendly personality, was obviously good-looking. He told Press and Elliot stories from his time in Hollywood. On the other hand, Beverly was stunningly beautiful. Her blonde hair, blue eyes, and perfect body drew people in. But she was not really who she said she was, and it was clear in the way she smiled, which never quite reached her eyes. Still, Beverly was stunningly beautiful, which is why Paul liked her. Before we begin, Press stood up and put his camera bag on the table. Before we begin, I'd like to set up my camera to record this meeting, he said. That's not possible, Gloria said, moving her hand indifferently. This place doesn't let you film unless it's for a court hearing. Unfortunately, you will need to put the camera away. When Press looked at Elliot, he responded right away. Our agreement is null and void if we can't shoot. We will have to start over with the talks. Beverly spoke up quickly and worriedly, you can't do that. At that moment, Kirk Southern walked into the room and smiled at everyone before looking straight at Beverly. Just letting you know I'm here, he said as he left. Press watched the people inside and noticed that even Gloria had a dreamy look on her face. Laughing to himself, he saw Beverly's begging face, which made Gloria reluctantly nod. Very well, Mr. Fulton. Gloria agreed, you can set up your camera. Her anger was clear. Take it as an exception. After setting up the camera and turning it on, they talked about the details of the breakup. The money from the sale was supposed to be split equally, but Press knew that the market didn't offer much equity. The money was also to be split evenly, even though there wasn't much of it. Paul mostly wrote and lived off the income from his last TV show. While Beverly was asking for alimony, Paul gave her those earnings instead. Paul spoke up and told Gloria, Beverly, just to be clear, you'll get royalties from the Gobbler Twins TV show. You give up any claims to my stamp or comic book collection since I'm giving you full rights to it. Also, you give up all rights to any works I've done in the past or will do in the future. Beverly said, I don't care about your comic books at all. I have all the things I require. One more thing that needed to be done was child support for Sarah Bracken, who was almost a year old. Gloria didn't like the part of the contract that said Paul would pay $1,500 a month to support any children he and Beverly had. Gloria said, I'd rather Sarah be named specifically. He yelled, listen. Paul didn't want anything to do with the woman who would soon be his ex-wife. If she wants to sleep with someone, she will. I'm sure of it because Beverly touched me right before she served the divorce papers. Maybe she's even pregnant right now. I'll not come back to this. Unless you want to renegotiate Mr. Bracken, the deal stays in place. Gloria replied, her face red with anger, I won't stand for that kind of language. Also, I think the language in this deal needs to be changed. Beverly quickly stepped in and said, I'll take the wording as it is. Even though Gloria tried to talk her out of it, Beverly seemed set on finalizing the split. When they got to the last thing, both Paul and Beverly signed the paper. After the official signed it, the witnesses did the same. Beverly, Paul, and each lawyer were given copies. Not a problem? Paul inquired. He stood up and said, thank goodness it's over and I'm no longer married to that awful woman. Everyone nodded. When Beverly and Gloria winced, Gloria stepped in to help. It's clear that I won't stand for that kind of talk. You should leave before security takes you out. Before Paul could answer, Kirk walked in through the open door. Some people were surprised when Beverly met him with a kiss on the cheek and a hug. Kirk reached out and touched Paul's hand. Hey Paul, how are you doing? Kirk, I'm fine, Paul told him, shaking his hand. I never married that cheating wife anymore. Kirk said, taking Beverly's hand, I'd heard rumors about her Hollywood reputation, but I didn't believe them. That being said, it looks like you were right. It was still a win for me. He laughed and said, yes, you did. Nevertheless, it was worth it. Who wants to bet? Beverly was confused and asked. You two seem to know each other. Kirk nodded. My friend Paul and I have been friends since college. What did the person bet? They laughed together, Paul and Kirk. Now Gloria and her helpers were confused. All right, Beverly, Paul laughed. Kirk was wrong, I bet him, he couldn't win over my loved and loyal wife. I'm disappointed. Beverly spoke up, tears in her eyes, but Kirk, you said you loved me. When I got divorced, you said you would marry me. Kirk shook his head and said, Beverly, when you married Paul, you promised to leave everyone else behind. I broke up with you after the wedding when I found out about the other guys you were seeing. 
Beverly broke down in tears, and Gloria had to comfort her for five minutes. After Beverly calmed down, Paul sat down next to her and squeezed her hand. He said, Beverly, I may be slow, but I really thought you loved me. I was very angry when I learned the truth a year later. I wanted to get a divorce right away. I knew I had to wait after thinking about Sarah. But I knew you had to learn a lesson when the DNA test showed she wasn't mine. Beverly turned pale when the DNA test was brought up. Gloria mumbled angrily, that's why you insisted on that clause. You made things possible for us. This whole thing was a lie. The goal was to trick my client. I demand that the whole divorce suit be thrown out. With a strange smile, Elliot told the counselor, you'll need more than luck. My client didn't mean to trick anyone. Your client says she got exactly what she wanted. The only person who is lying here is your client, who is trying to pass off her child as Mr. Brackens. If you think you have a case, try your hardest. The proof in this room speaks for itself, in my opinion. There was only Beverly sobbing to break the silence in the room. After that, Paul spoke directly to her. Please look at me, Beverly. His ex-wife looked at him suspiciously. Paul deepened his sigh. Truthfully, I'll tell you. I thought making you look bad would make me feel good, but it didn't. To the core, I loved you. Even after I found out you had betrayed me, I still cared about you. Kirk was right about how you're known. There was no secret that you would do anything for a part. I think I was the only one who didn't know what kind of person you really are. It was hard for Beverly to catch her breath, and each breath made her chest heave. When Press saw this, she knew Paul still liked her. Remember when the Gobbler twins cast you? He inquired. Beverly said yes. According to her, you had not helped her at all, even though she thought her hard work had paid off. You're wrong, Paul said. I told you to do well on your own, but I secretly worked behind the scenes to get you that job. Beverly told him, you're lying. I qualified for that part. I really wanted you to believe that, but I had to give up things to make it happen. Paul stated, I gave up some of my future royalties, which will stop in about two and a half years. The way Beverly looked showed that she didn't believe it. Gloria understood she had been wrong, she had never looked into the royalty's status. Beverly's understanding was more important than her shame. Beverly felt proud of what she had done and realized that it all started with her husband's sacrifice, which made her cry even more. Paul told Sarah in a soft voice, I won't leave you. Though she's not my real daughter, I love and care for her very much. I put $200,000 into a trust fund for her that will grow to $500,000. Sarah's costs will be covered by the interest, and her bills will be checked for accuracy. She will be able to trust people when she turns 25. When it comes to you, stick with the serial payments. They are necessary. It's time to be honest, Beverly, your acting skills aren't great. Because of your good name, you might get small parts until your good looks go away. Paul said, if you're okay with trading favors for roles, go ahead. This made Beverly turn angry. She was angry, but she turned to Kirk for support and kept quiet. Paul gave a sad sigh. You probably haven't cared about anyone but yourself all these years, Beverly. I hope that when you find love, it treats you better than I did, he told Kirk before going on. But that pain could come back today, if it does, I feel for you. He steadily got up. Now is the end of our talk, Beverly. For help, please contact Elliot. To avoid trouble, take care of Sarah. After saying goodbye, they left together. Press quickly packed up and headed to the airport before the snowstorm shut it down, while Beverly sobbed in her arms. A year later, for the yearly review, Preston Turner sat down across from his boss, James Baker. Press knew that every case he filed was looked at periodically, but during the yearly review, his boss looked closely at cases that Press thought should have been settled. Press hoped to finish three cases from Cleveland and one from Akron today. After reading the excellent annual review, the two men got down to business and looked over the cases to make sure they were over. You should go over this project with Gary and Jason. Explain why you think they should be shut down, Mr. Baker asked, calling the president, Gary Harris, and Jason Witten together. Press pointed to his file. You may have forgotten that they were going to get married soon, but we found out that Gary's fiancée was cheating on him with other women. At a church meeting, Gary made fun of Belinda in front of everyone before leaving. Mr. Baker agreed and said, yes, I remember that video. I practically felt sorry for her. And it looks like she really cared about Gary. How is she doing now? When her cheating was found out, Belinda left Cleveland. 
In the end, she made it to Las Vegas, where she works as a waitress and sometimes as a gambler. She stays in touch with her mother, but her father won't talk to her. Belinda keeps dating different guys after her marriage didn't work out. Interestingly, she still remembers Gary and writes to him from time to time. It's strange that Gary seems to have forgiven her because he sometimes answers her messages. However, there is no chance of getting along again. My sources say Gary is now seriously dating Linda Chaucer and plans to ask her to marry him in the next two months. How about taking care of the best man? In fact, we didn't need to step in. He lost his job as a district attorney, and the Bar Association took away his license for five years. After the wedding mess-up, he lost all of his friends and quickly left town. The woman who was Belinda's boss and also his wife cheated on him during their breakup. He's not poor, but he has lost half of his assets and his three children won't talk to him anymore. Where is Jason Witten? He married Melissa, and they look really happy together. Melissa also agreed to sign a prenuptial agreement. Oh, and they can't wait to have their first child any minute now. Nodded Mr. Baker. I agree that these two cases should be closed. What's new with the Ben Sharpen case? As planned, Ben was able to sue the biological dads of their children and get back the child support payments he made for them. Still, Ben did more than just get his money back. You already know that we found his ex-wife's secret assets in the drug trade in other countries. After taking out Ben's alimony payments and giving him $300,000 for losses, we told the IRS about the rest of the money. It was successful to take civil action against the law firm and the bank. After paying for his lawyers, Ben got almost $2 million. The wives of all three biological dads got divorced. While two lawyers tried to get prenups for their wives, they were thrown out because the husbands didn't make sure that their wives' lawyers would review the documents independently. During their divorces, each father got a large payout. As for Ben, he left the Cleveland Clinic and opened up several of his own medical clinics. He also met Linda Crawford, a nurse who used to work at the Cleveland Clinic and now works at one of Ben's centers. Additionally, Ben joined a gym and has since lost 40 pounds. He used to be married to her and she has kids. Mr. Baker asked. Among the charges against Mrs. Sharpen that led to her conviction were drug dealing and tax evasion. A teenager's death was linked to the drugs she sold. She got terms that ranged from 20 years to life in prison. Between five and seven years were given to her children as punishments. Also, her four most recent partners got jail time, but I didn't look into how long because they weren't part of our project. Very well done. I also agree that this case should be closed. The case of Janet Arnold was especially rewarding. Do not stop when you press continue. I am very happy with how things turned out. One of our co-workers was too nice to Mrs. Arnold and her kids, which was embarrassing. Mr. Baker agreed, I remember the case. A lot of time was spent talking about it in several leadership meetings. Do you think we can end it now? Thank you, sir. The last decisions have been made. Half of the assets we were able to find have been given to Mrs. Arnold. I thought at first that more assets were hidden, but knowing Mr. Arnold's financial situation, I'm sure we've found everything. Oh, and how is Mr. Arnold? Once Mrs. Arnold's case was over, we took care of Mr. Arnold's tax debts, including interest. You already know that we never pay the government interest because they take so long to process extra tax estimates. Because they aren't working hard, we don't think they should get interest. Even so, Mr. Arnold was left with just under $200,000 after the deal. Even though this amount is more than the highest allowed for breach of contract, I was ready to go ahead with it. One of his business partnerships, though, went bad, leaving him with only about $30,000. Right now he's selling used cars. How are the other two teams doing? Mr. Baker asked. Even if he only got half of his share of the money, that would be too much. He had to sell his shares in the other two businesses to make up for the losses he had to pay from the failed company. We made sure Mrs. Arnold's claim was taken care of before he sold his shares, though. She is now getting paid what she is owed. Another thing is that when I pressed grind, a document was made. The extradition warrant seems to have had a problem with the papers. During three months, Mr. Arnold was locked up in Costa Rica. He went in a little overweight and came out a lot thinner. Police say the marshals were annoyed because they had never seen a man so excited to go back to a U.S. jail. Just to be nosy, Press's boss asked what happened to the woman Mr. Arnold ran away with. Ah, Tammy, Press said softly. After being homeless in Costa Rica for a while, it took her almost two months to get back to the United States. It's likely that she learned to value America more. 
Even so, she had a hard time getting a job because of how she behaved with her previous boss. In the end, she got a job as an office assistant. So far as I know, she hasn't gone back to her old ways of gold digging. But we'll keep an eye on her, and if she does something like that again, especially with one of our members, we'll do something about it. I'd rather be safe, Mr. Baker thought as he read the report carefully. Let's keep this case open for a little while longer to keep an eye on Tammy's acts and see if Mr. Arnold has any other assets that he hasn't told us about. Mr. Paul Bracken, let's move on to the last case. While I know what it is, I'd like you to learn about what it does. There was a fight over the divorce, but the court turned it down. At the moment, Mr. Bracken is making a new TV show called Asterisk, Runaway Husband's Asterisk. He worked out a deal with the show's company. It has been in the top 10 every week since its release and has already been renewed for another two years. Interestingly, I think Beverly, Paul's ex-wife, would be a great fit for the part of the narrator. I have a strong feeling that he saw her in the role, and I'm not sure if Mr. Southern was able to avoid Beverly's impact. Nodded Mr. Baker. That day was the end of their relationship, and I think Mr. Bracken was right when he said Beverly would fall in love and maybe be betrayed. Based on what I've seen, Beverly did feel something for Kirk and was very sad when he broke up with her. After that, she hadn't seen him in six months and only went on a few dates with him. Beverly works as a real estate agent right now, and it looks like she's not in a relationship with anyone. It looks like she spends most of her free time with her daughter Sarah. She's surprising everyone by being a much better mother than they thought. She also performs at the neighborhood community theater from time to time. Even though it's not really your job. I thought I'd look it over since you asked me to. Based on how things turned out, I think it should be shut down. Press stood up when he was done with his evaluation. After checking for anything else, I'll get back to my work. Yes, I would like to talk to you about something else. Mr. Baker waved for Press to sit down again. What does that sound like, sir? You already know that we recently passed the 2 million mark, and our growth is going faster than we thought it would. More people need to be in the field to represent us, especially experienced regional supervisors. As of this morning, I got permission to promote you to one of those supervisory jobs. Best of luck. Press was surprised, but he was able to tell Mr. Baker how grateful he was. Congratulations, Press. You deserve it. Your work has been truly outstanding. Your new job will start on Monday. However, I need to warn you that three or four of the projects your new team is working on are having major problems right now. I'm sure you'll be able to fix them. Wishing you luck. Press smiled as he left his boss's office after shaking hands.